In this video, I'm gonna walk you through the history of baseball cards, starting way back in the 1800s and coming up to the present day. There's a lot to cover here, so let's get to it. What is going on everybody? Thanks for joining me on my channel, Brutus on Baseball. I've got a big one here today that I've been working on for a while that I wanted to finally share with everybody. And that's the history of baseball cards, where they come from, how they evolved, and what the state of the hobby is today. There's a lot of information contained in this one, so I've had to split it up into separate episodes. So be sure after you watch this one to check back next week, or if you've caught this one later, to look for the second or maybe third episodes, depending on how many I end up doing, that talk all about the history. Before we get started, I have to say that there were a number of different resources that I used for this. One of the biggest ones was the book Mint Condition, How Baseball Cards Became an American Obsession by Dave Jameson. This was a pivotal book for me to learn a lot about the history of cards, especially going back a ways. It doesn't cover the modern era very much, but it's definitely a great read to learn a lot more about the origins of trading cards. If you've read the book, you'll probably notice that there's a lot of information from that book contained in this video. And if you haven't, go look for it. It's a really great read and there's a lot of information in that book that's not included in this video. Also the Library of Congress baseball cards website, a lot of great information about the pre-war era and another website, the pre-war cards blog and database for pre-1948 sports cards. And of course the Cardboard Connection and Baseball Cardpedia, these two definitely helped me a lot more, especially when it came to more modern cards and understanding how things evolved over time and got to be the way that they are today with the current sets out there. So now that we got that out of the way, let's start off at the beginning with the origins of trading cards. Now, some consider that the earliest baseball cards were created by a sporting goods company named Peck and Snyder Baseball and Sportsman Emporium in 1869. See, Andrew Peck was a former Union soldier in the Civil War and a baseball enthusiast that upon returning home from the war, he started a company that manufactured baseballs and bats among many other things. And that's how it all started. In 1869, Peck and Snyder produced small cards that were handed out for free to promote advertising for many of their goods. And the cards depicted a group photo of 10 players from the first openly professional baseball team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings. Without really knowing it, Andrew Peck probably created the very first baseball card that snowballed into a major industry over time. The inclusion of baseball cards was actually just a continuation of the same gimmick of including trading cards along with goods to be peddled. It's just that those trading cards typically featured celebrities or war heroes or cartoon drawings at that time. It's thought that Peck and Snyder were the first to really consider baseball players as worthy of being included on trading cards as well. But including cards with the sale of sporting goods was just small potatoes compared to the business of selling tobacco. In the 1860s, the tobacco industry catered mostly to pipe and cigar smokers, and pre-rolled cigarettes were often seen as low class. That is, until the Civil War promoted the use of cigarettes among soldiers because they were so easy to pack, ship, carry. Over the next few decades, the tobacco industry was consolidated into four primary companies that had the majority of the business. And you'll recognize some of those primary companies when we talk about them in a few minutes. But a man by the name of James Buchanan Duke, or Buck Duke as he liked to be called, saw the potential for cigarettes where others didn't. They were cheap, they were easy to produce, and Duke was a young man whose father was already entrenched in the tobacco industry, running the Duke & Sons Tobacco Company against their main rival, Bull Durham Tobacco. In the early 1880s, he was sent away to New York City to establish a new factory for the company, but he quickly saw that competing in cigars and tobacco was a lost cause because of how much competition there already was in the city. But he saw that investing in cigarette-making machines to produce more cigarettes than anyone else at a time when the leading companies believed that no one would buy cigarettes made by a machine, was the smarter way to go. To market their new cigarettes, Duke used the image of beautiful celebrities of the time on their advertisements starting in 1884. But beyond advertising, Duke wanted to include picture cards of women inside their packs as a collectible incentive to buying Duke cigarettes over their competitors. They were the first to number their cards to create the drive to complete a full set. 
And it didn't take long for Duke's competitors to take notice of the new collecting craze. And before long, all the major tobacco companies were printing cards of their own. The first sets, of course, included all sorts of celebrities, war heroes, exotic animals, politicians, and of course, the first baseball players. And the companies putting out these cards understood that children were the primary driving forces for collecting these cards. If their parents weren't loyal to a specific brand, children could convince their parents to buy Duke cigarettes in order to bring home those collectible cards, thereby creating brand loyalty where it wasn't before. Now, although Duke was the first ones to consider trading cards in cigarette packages, the first company to actually put cards of baseball players, individual players, into their cigarette packaging is thought to be Duke's rival, Allen and Ginter. In 1887, Allen and Ginter created the World Champion series that included 10 baseball player cards in addition to cards of boxers and wrestlers and gunslingers. These cards were artistic depictions of the players on smaller cards that were designed to fit into cigarette packages. All of this was happening at a time when baseball had recently established itself as a professional sport in the 1870s. The National League had established itself in 1876, and several more leagues like the American Association, the Northwest Western League and the Players League began popping up throughout the East Coast and into the Midwest. And in the late 1880s, Goodwin and Company Tobacco embarked on an epic journey to create one of the most complex sets of baseball cards ever produced. The Old Judge set, named after one of Goodwin's tobacco brands that would feature the cards at that time. Their goal was to take actual photographs instead of artistic depictions of every baseball player on a total of 40 major and minor league teams that they had identified as worthy of cataloging. What they ended up with was a set spanning several years that included over 2,300 cards and over 500 different players. Their photography typically included full body portraits, often trying to depict set up action shots for the players. And during this time, Goodwin produced both the old judge set over the years from 1887 to about 1890, as well as the first Gypsy Queen set that was produced also using the same photographs from the old judge set. The old judge set was very popular with baseball fans at that time due to how extensive the set was and how often they tried to update players switching teams over the span of those four years. But the set also proved to be so extensive that it was impossible to collect back then, and it's just as impossible to collect today. Even today, it's impossible to know exactly how many cards are even out there and to find ones that are available. Uh, it's debatable whether it was the rise of cigarettes that brought about the rise of baseball cards or the rise of baseball cards that brought about the rise of cigarettes. They kind of went hand in hand. Tobacco salesmen at first wouldn't deal in cigarettes, but after the craze that collecting baseball cards created, they had no choice pretty soon. And a big reason was that young boys started to get caught up in buying cigarettes for the cards. Not many states had laws in place prohibiting the sale of tobacco products to minors, and soon the young generation became hooked on both collecting cards and smoking. And I should take a quick aside here. I'm talking a lot about smoking and cigarettes because that's really the origin of baseball cards, how they came to be. But I hope in today's day and age, all the kids out there that may be watching know that smoking is not good for you and you shouldn't do it. My public service announcement aside, let's keep going. In the mid to late 1880s, another change was coming that would revolutionize the tobacco industry. Duke invested in a machine that would roll cigarettes and at least double production while cutting the costs in half. At first, the industry sneered at the machine rolled cigarettes thinking no one would buy them, but soon they had no choice but to follow suit again, and only a handful of companies could keep up as the smaller manufacturers either went out of business or were bought out by the bigger companies. As the cost of producing cigarettes decreased, the cost of producing trading cards actually increased, and the cost of including a card in each pack rose to nearly half the cost of producing a pack of cigarettes itself. But since Duke continued to include cards in his packaging, the other big companies just had to keep up. But Duke, again, had his sights on burying all of his competitors so deep that they would have no choice but to fold. And that's what kind of happened in 1889. The heads of the five biggest tobacco companies, including the giants like Allen & Ginter and Goodwin & Co., met and agreed to form the American Tobacco Company. Essentially, it was a monopoly on the tobacco industry, and that would allow them to cut costs. And a big part of that was eliminating the need to include trading cards in their packaging. Duke was named president of the new company, and as a result of the amalgamation of these four biggest, the production of baseball cards would essentially be shelved for the next two decades. Between 
1890 and 1909, Duke and his American tobacco company gobbled up hundreds of smaller tobacco firms, either incorporating their brands or shutting them down completely. The need for advertising and inserting trading cards into packages of cigarettes disappeared, basically. But by around 1909, there were rumblings that the American Tobacco Company was considered to be in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the monopoly could soon be broken up by the government. So Duke once again could see that future coming, and he knew he would soon have to compete once again to sell his cigarettes. In response, he put together plans for what would be called the T206 set that would be released between 1909 and 1911. This set is often called the monster by collectors, because not only does it feature 524 different cards in the full set, which was a huge set for that time, including several players featured on multiple cards in different poses or for different teams. But but in addition to how many cards there were of players, each of those player cards can also feature up to 16 different backs that advertised a variety of cigarette brands made by the American Tobacco Company. Old Mill, Piedmont, Polar Bear, and Sweet Caporal are just a few of the more commonly known examples. The T206 produced many of the most popular cards to this day, like the coveted Hannes Wagner card, the most expensive card out there, a number of Ty Cobb card variations, and the difficult to find Eddie Plank card. Several more card sets were also released over the next several years, representing minor leagues across the country as well as several major league releases like the T205 with the gold borders and the turkey red issue. The first of its kind, the E98 card series, was produced by an unknown candy company. A sign of things to come as the baseball card world entered a new era and steered away from tobacco and into candy and bubblegum that was finally geared much more appropriately towards children. After a few short years, tobacco companies stopped printing baseball cards again to include in their cigarette packages, and as a result, card releases mostly came to a halt by tobacco companies around 1915. The void was slowly replaced over time by candy and gum companies, starting with examples like American Caramel and Cracker Jack, and progressed through the 1910s and 1920s with releases from candy companies, bread, bakery companies, publishing companies, and even novelty releases like postcard-sized exhibit sets that were sold out at vending machines at arcades and amusement parks across the country. The majority of these were local releases. They didn't have a lot of organization to them and didn't have widespread distribution for a number more years. The next rise in baseball card distribution coincided with a new invention by the Fleer Corporation of a bright pink bubble gum that we all recognize today. It was called Double Bubble, and it was the first commercially successful bubble gum that was invented in the 1920s and really manufactured and sold starting around 1928. Bubble gum was widely manufactured by the early to mid 1930s. The industry really exploded. So again, companies were looking for a way to promote brand loyalty among children. So they turned to comic strips and trading cards. Fleer first tried to foray into baseball cards with a single set in 1923, called the Bob's and Fruit Hearts Candy. But Fleer's focus was on comic strips mostly, while a competitor of Fleer, the Gowdy Gum Company, chose to focus on trading cards. They started with cards depicting Native American leaders, but by 1933 they had produced Big League Chewing Gum, which included a set of 240 baseball cards that could be had, with some of the biggest stars in the league appearing more than once in the set. The 1933 Gowdy set is perhaps the most recognizable set produced between 1915 and 1947. Although Gowdy investing in baseball cards at the height of the Great Depression was considered by some to be a foolish decision, the time the timing was perfect because the average fan couldn't afford to attend an actual game anymore to see their favorite players. The inclusion of cards that featured their favorite players in these gum packages that cost only one cent each was the main link that fans, most of which were young boys, had during the decade to stay connected to their heroes through the Great Depression. Gowdy continued to release sets from 1933 to 1938, skipping 1937, with the 1938 Heads Up set standing out as one of the biggest leaps of faith that featured an eye-catching design that somehow simultaneously ridiculed and respected within the hobby. Other bubblegum and candy companies followed Gowdy's lead, including DeLong's 1933 set and National Chiclay's Diamond Stars set that spanned three years from 1934 to 1936, 
and saw several versions of these cards reprinted with various backs throughout that three-year period. But a man that would have one of the biggest impacts on the future of the baseball card industry was a lifelong entrepreneur of many different trades that had found little success up through the late 1930s. And that was Jacob Warren Bowman. He decided there had to be extra room in the booming bubblegum industry and established the Bowman Gum Company in Philadelphia in the 1930s. And there certainly was room, especially since Gowdy would stop releasing baseball card sets in 1938, and suddenly there was space for Bowman. Bowman would spend much of the 1930s creating trading card sets that were focused on Native American leaders, law enforcement, and criminal figures at the time, the really popular horrors of war set, and pinup girls. But with no direct competition at the time, Bowman would enter the baseball card arena in 1939 with the first of three sets called Play Ball. They featured larger cards than had ever existed before when they had to be inserted into smaller packaging and crisper photography. But it would take Bowman longer than expected to really make that impact. And that's because by 1941, World War II was looming in everyone's thoughts across the United States. After the U.S. finally entered the war, baseball became secondary to the war effort as more and more stars left their teams to be drafted into the military, and card collecting took a back seat. Getting deeper into the war, gum companies themselves had to shut down as first paper supplies, and finally rubber supplies were donated to the government to aid in the war effort. Play Ball was last released in 1941, and even Gowdy, three years after last releasing his set in 1938, would make a last feeble attempt at including a set in 1941, before they ducked out of the card industry for good. And with the war and the gum companies really slowing down the production, for the third time the printing of baseball cards on a nationwide scale would cease again between 1942 and 1947. Now before we leave this era behind, we're going to talk about a couple interesting things that came from this era. The thing about collecting baseball cards during this time period was that children were incredibly frugal, wanting to save their favorite cards in the best condition they could. They didn't play marbles or jacks to win cards, or they didn't put them in their bicycle spokes as would happen in later years. For this reason, the kids that grew up during the Great Depression took care of their bubblegum cards, and any cards that weren't donated as paper supply to the war effort from the 1930s actually survived in fairly good condition compared to the cards of the 50s and 60s that came later. And as an aside, I've mentioned some of these set designations, T206, E98. Where did these come from? Well, a man by the name of Jefferson Burdick from Syracuse, New York, showed up at the door of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City one day. He was an ailing man, although he was only in his late 40s, but with no family or heirs, he wanted to find a place to donate his vast card collection that easily numbered into the tens of thousands and dated back to the 1880s. And tens of thousands may not seem like a big deal today, but that was a lot of cards, considering it was only 1947 at the time and before the modern post-war era of cards would come into play. The curator at the Met told Burdick he would accept the donation, but only if Burdick himself organized the collection. And with nothing much better to do, Burdick took the challenge, and many thought that this project is what kept him alive for another 14 years. Over that time, Burdick would quit his job, move to Manhattan, and dedicate the vast majority of his time to do his best to identify and record every trading card that he could find that was ever made in the United States. Because of this endeavor, the Met is the owner of perhaps the world's most extensive vintage baseball card collection, although the vast majority of them were glued into place in their display albums. But when cataloging all of those cards, Burdick's problem was that the cigarette, candy, bread companies, and all the other card producers, they didn't often keep records of what cards were produced, or even a checklist for which cards were in a given set. So Burdick had to set to work researching all of these card manufacturers and identifying all the cards in the sets, including ones that he didn't even own himself. No small feat at a time, a full half century before the internet was even invented. His primary the primary method of researching cards across the country, especially since there were so many local releases, was sending letters through the mail to a small network of diehard collectors across the country that he had created. See, he created the American Card Catalog, 
and he assigned a naming convention that gave pre-war cards their designation, like N for 19th century tobacco cards, T, like T206 for the 20th century tobacco cards, and E designations for early candy and gum, like E106 for the 1915 American caramel set. Burdick was the man who gave order to the chaos that was pre-war trading cards. It was the one task in his life that seemed to give him purpose. He accumulated over 300,000 cards by the time he finished this cataloging, and produced just short of 400 display albums for the Met, each of which presented the cards in chronological and sequential order. He died only two months after pasting his last card into the final album. And it's interesting to note too that at Burdick's time, cards were worth no more than a penny or two apiece. Even the ones that he identified as extremely rare, they were still easy to buy. Paying much more than that for any card was considered outrageous at that time. There were no dealers, no card shops, no conventions or shows. It was just about the joy of collecting, typically in a pretty small group of people. But a lot of things were about to change as we're about to enter into the another era of the baseball card world. A few years after the war had drawn to a close, the Bowman Gum Company would start issuing card sets again in 1948, but this time under the name Bowman instead of Playball. Bowman was really ahead of its time as well because they were signing players to contracts to reproduce their images on cards. This was seen as vital by Bowman, especially after Johnny Mize had sued another company, Gum Products Incorporated, in the early 1940s after their double play cards had used his image without permission. Even though Gum Products had won that lawsuit, it was a sign that gum companies had to get their act together and get players under contract in order to avoid future problems. Now, also in 1948, another set was produced. The American Leaf Tobacco Company had been importing tobacco for cigars since the 1890s. The brain trust of that company searched for ways to diversify, and after seeing the success of companies like Fleer and Bowman, they diversified into the business of making bubblegum as well in 1940. And the American Leaf Tobacco Company, which is an offshoot of Leaf International based out of Europe, produced a baseball card set. The 1948-49 Leaf set was released over two years and had copyrights on the back of the cards that spanned both 1948 and 1949 with many of the cards containing information from the 1948 season on the backs as well. The set was numbered between 1 and 168, but for whatever reason, the set was not finished and featured cards that were skip numbered, so only 98 total cards were actually produced. It was Leaf's first attempt at creating cards, but the landscape would soon change. You see, the Shoren brothers, owners of the American Leaf Tobacco Company by that time, after numerous mergers and buyouts, decided to rebrand as Topps Chewing Gum Incorporated. At first, they were looking into trading cards of popular cultural figures in America, but one of their key marketers, a man by the name of Cy Berger, convinced ownership that baseball players maintained their popularity year in and year out, as kids always wanted to collect the players on their team. Topps had the foresight to sign as many players as they could to contracts to include their images on cards as well. But Bowman had the rights to include their cards specifically in packages of gum. So Topps had to devise a different vehicle and chose to include their first set along with Taffy. But the first set that Topps attempted was pretty much a disaster. Not the 1952 Topps set that everyone usually thinks is Topps first, but the 1951 Redbacks or Bluebacks. The first problem was that there was a varnish that was included on the cards that ruined the taste of the taffy. And when you think about it, it probably wasn't too healthy for kids to be eating either. In addition to that, the cards were issued in a 52 card sets to mimic playing cards. And they were even meant to be used to play games with things like walks, outs, hits, and home runs. But the design was poorly executed and only the player's floating head was included on the card front. Between the design problems and the candy's taste, the cards did not sell the product. Topps knew they had to do something different, and they again relied on Cyberger to do it. The first thing that he realized is that the Bowman employee charged with procuring signed contracts for major league players was a woman, and she wasn't allowed into the team locker rooms at that time. So what Cy did is he strolled right into the locker rooms ahead of her to chat up the players before she even had the chance to do it. And the next thing he did was hire a former minor league journeyman that would accompany him. 
He was well known around the league and it allowed him to put the players more at ease when talking to them about contracts. And finally, he doubled the rate that Bowman was paying for signing the contract. At the end of the day, Berger ended up walking out with signed contracts from the vast majority of ballplayers. And Topps also designed cards that would pioneer the baseball card collecting industry for decades to come. A man by the name of Woody Gelman headed the Topps department of artists that would put together a handful of card designs and the artwork that the Topps executives would vote on every year to decide which one would be the design for that year. They were the first card company to put a facsimile of each player's autograph on the card front, as well as the team logo which surprisingly had never been done before. And for the back of the cards, they were the first to imagine putting the player's stats right there on the card so that future generations of kids and fans could learn and memorize all their favorite players' accomplishments. And finally, they were the ones to standardize the size of cards for the first time, initially at two and five eighths inches by three and three quarter inches, which was eventually reduced to two and a half inches by three and a half inches in 1957. The initial run of 310 cards from that 1952 top set sold so incredibly well that Topps decided to print a previously unplanned second run of 97 additional cards, one of which would include Mickey Mantle's first Topps card it would become the most sought after and expensive baseball card of the post-war era. Of course, the release of 1952 tops brought on a lawsuit almost immediately from Bowman because many of those players had signed exclusive contracts with both companies. The final ruling was that Bowman's rights had been infringed since they had signed most of the players first and that a player may only sign a contract with one company and that all of the companies would not have the right to print an image of that player. It was too late for the 1952 set, but the ruling set things up for a fierce competition between Bowman and Topps to sign players exclusively for the 1953 season. And over the next couple of years in the mid-1950s, both Bowman and Topps sought to improve on their card designs, using full color or including hand-drawn player portraits. Bowman increased its card size to match Topps' set and included player stats on the back as well. The legal fight to obtain as many players' signatures for rights to their image Images went on in the background, and as a result, many of the sets of that time were vastly reduced in numbers and didn't include some of the biggest stars if that set wasn't able to sign them. Production costs continued to rise to the point that profit margins for the gum were razor thin, and by 1956, Bowman had had enough of fighting with the competition for something that wasn't even their primary product that they would sell. They offered to sell all of their gum and card manufacturing machinery, as well as their signed player contracts to Topps for $200,000. With Topps coming out on top by 1956 and obtaining the rights to almost all major league players, it was nearly impossible for any other company to challenge them on the perch that they had. And the Topps contract language stated that only Topps had the right to print a player's image on a baseball card that was packaged either alone or in combination with chewing gum, candy, or confection. Other smaller gum and candy companies like Donruss and Leaf had no way to compete and had to pivot away from including baseball cards in their products. Fleer had been one of the most recognizable and successful gum manufacturers for decades before Topps even came along in the 1950s. Remember, they had originally invented bubble gum in the 1920s, but Fleer had only dabbled in including baseball cards with their products. And after the Topps explosion in the 1950s and 1960s, Fleer actually saw their profits being eaten away as more kids switch to tops to get the latest baseball cards of their favorite players and teams. And by the early 1960s, Topps had passed Fleer as the top bubblegum company in the world, something Fleer had not expected to have happen. Topps had benefited from numerous inventions and strategies produced by Fleer to make and market bubblegum. So Fleer asked the Federal Trade Commission directly why they shouldn't be able to do the same and benefit from the Topps baseball card gimmick for selling the gum. So starting in 1962 and going for nearly three years, the FTC held a hearing that included testimony from major league players, gum executives, and marketing professionals for the purpose of trying to show that Topps operated in a monopoly on baseball cards. 
The hearing showed how Topps had scouts and minor league managers on their payroll who had helped to sign the best up-and-coming minor league players before they even debuted in the big leagues, and how they had effectively barred any other company from being able to compete with them. There was a lot of pressure from Topps executives as well, and even some of the team management, for those players to sign the contract. By 1961, Cy Berger's whining and dining of Major League players had resulted in Topps having signed 414 of the 421 players in Major League Baseball. And this was all happening at the same time that the Players Association was formed in 1953, and players began to push back on salaries for their big league teams. But for whatever reason, the players didn't ask many questions about contracts with Tops, or they didn't recognize the leverage that they actually held. Some think it was because players were ecstatic to see their images on baseball cards, while others point to the coziness between Tops and the teams in the Major League Baseball itself because of all Tops had done to get baseball into the hearts and minds of the young generation across the country. The only player that seemed to recognize the leverage he had was Ted Williams who declined to sign with Topps and renew his contract in 1958. He instead signed a contract with the highest bidder, which happened to be Fleer, for a total of $12,500. And Topps wouldn't compete with that because they didn't want to pay him a large sum and then see a lot of other star players start to follow suit and demand higher compensation for signing contracts. So what Fleer did is they released an 80 card set in 1959 that was centered entirely around Ted Williams at different points in his career, and even a lot of cards having nothing to do with baseball. And that set absolutely flopped. Apparently kids weren't that interested in a baseball set that only featured one player on every card. Fleer followed this set up though in 1960 and 1961 with the Baseball Greats sets, which featured long retired Hall of Fame players that weren't under contract by Topps. But it turns out that kids at that time had even less interest in historic greats because they weren't playing in that day and time. And after those three failed attempts, Fleer didn't produce a 1962 set as it tried to gather more players into the fold to sign contracts. And then they tried one last time in 1963. By this time, there were enough players whose contracts had recently expired with tops that Fleer was actually able to make a set of 67 current major league players, including several all-stars like Brooks Robinson, Willie Mays, Carl Yastrzemski, Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, Warren Spahn, Roberto Clemente, and Bob Gibson. But Topps still had that clause that only they had the right to print a player's image on a baseball card that was packaged either alone or in combination with chewing gum, candy, or confection. And so Fleer decided to package their baseball cards with a cherry-flavored cookie. But a cookie with next to no sugar because it couldn't be considered a confection or else they'd be in trouble. So as you can imagine, the product was once again not popular with kids. Although that set over time has gained a lot of popularity with vintage collectors simply due to the great players included in the checklist, it just didn't do much at that time to help Fleer out. Around the same time, the Federal Trade Commission had filed a complaint against Topps, alleging that Topps was engaging in unfair competition through its aggregation of exclusive contracts. The commission eventually concluded that Topps' monopoly was only related to the sale of baseball cards with gum, and that other companies were free to include their cards with other products. Fleer, of course, had already tried this and failed with their cherry cookie. So less than a decade after Topps had bought out Bowman and all of their player contracts, this time they bought out Fleer of their player contracts for just shy of $400,000. A pretty large sum at that time compared to what the players were getting for their contracts. And Fleer would disappear from the baseball card scene for almost the next two decades. And the funniest thing is by the decade of the 1960s, the gum included in a package of baseball cards had truly taken a back seat to the cards themselves. And young boys often bought a pack of cards to only absentmindedly chew or even throw out the gum and focus on the players in the pack instead. This was the generation of kids playing games with their cards, flipping them against the wall to try and win a friend's stack of cards, or put them in the spokes of their bicycles to make sounds as they rode around the neighborhood. And this brings us to the next era in which tops would operate however they wished 
because there was no direct competition. And that is where we're gonna stop it in this week's video. There's just so much information I wanted to cover here. I couldn't include it or else it would be like an hour, hour and a half long video. Be sure to check back again next week to catch the rest of the story of the history of baseball cards. Until next time, keep talking baseball, take care of yourself, and we'll see you around.